Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Airplane Anatomy. In this series, I break down different airplanes from their history to their engineering to how they fly. So today in episode 14, we're going to be talking about a plane that is probably no stranger to a lot of you guys out there. And it's a well-known and well-loved plane that is used by eight different air forces around the world. And that is the F-A-18 Hornet. Now, at the time of inception, it seemed to be almost an impossible task to be able to combine the functionalities of four different fighter and attack aircrafts into one single aircraft, but that was exactly the problem the engineers needed to solve. And on top of that, this aircraft was ordered by the US Navy, meaning that it needed to operate on carriers with very high reliability and very low maintenance. So how exactly were the engineers at Lockheed able to solve all of this and put them into one jet, and what design secrets did the F-18 have that allowed it to be the jack of all trades. Well, stay tuned. In 1974, the US Air Force hosted a lightweight fighter competition. And note this wasn't a collab with WWE, but instead they wanted American aerospace companies to come up with a cheaper alternative for the F-15 Eagle. One such design that was proposed by a company named Northrop was named the YF-17 Cobra, the Y standing for prototype aircraft. Now, unfortunately, the Air Force eventually selected its competitor, the General Dynamics YF-16, for this program, and this eventually became the F-16 Viper. But as for the YF-17, as opposed to being casted aside and forgotten, as is the fate for most experimental aircrafts that don't win their bid, it actually had a slightly different fate. Because around the same time, the Navy was also looking for a new lightweight aircraft to replace both the F-4 Phantom II and the A-7 Corsair II. Just one problem though, the F-4 is typically used as a fighter or bomber aircraft, whereas the A-7 plays a attack and strike role. So the challenge with this new replacement aircraft was that it needed to fulfill all of these roles at once. Now this was named the Navy Air Combat Fighter, or the NACF program. To build this new naval aircraft, Northrop decided to partner with McDonnell Douglas, another experienced carrier aircraft manufacturer that had actually built the F-4 Phantom II. So together they began to transform the YF-17 prototype aircraft into what would eventually become the F-A-18 today. Now, one of the most distinct advantages of the F-A-18 is its maneuverability, especially at high angles of attack. Now, this is due to a number of design characteristics. First, the aircraft has many oversized flight control surfaces, like enlarged horizontal stabilizers, flaps, and leading edge slats that all help improve handling at high angles of attack or low airspeeds. The F-A-18 was also the very first tactical jet to have full fly-by-wire controls. And this wasn't just any fly-by-wire, it had quadruple redundancy fly-by-wire controls. Cool. Reliability is also a very important requirement, considering that the jet would spend most of its time over vast expanses of water and the rest on a very cramped carrier. Now, this may have been the reason that the Navy was so insistent on the YF-17 to begin with, since it was the only presented prototype with twin engines as opposed to one engine. So to further increase reliability, the engineers actually didn't fit the F-A-18 with the most powerful engines at that time, which were the Pratt & Whitney F-100 engines that the F-15 and the F-16 had. Instead, they went with a less performance but more reliable General Dynamic F-100 engines. Now, these engines were not only extremely resistant to stall and flame out even in very extreme conditions, but they only required a crew of 4 20 minutes to detach and without any special equipment. So because of this, the Hornet is extremely robust. Its mean time between failures is about three times that of any other Navy strike aircraft, even though its required maintenance time is only half. The F-18 first entered service in 1983 and has began to take on extensive attack and fighter roles in conflicts ever since. For example, during a mission, two F-18 successfully shot down two intercepting Iraqi MiG-21s, then went on to successfully complete their original mission of attacking a target on the ground. Now, this just shows how versatile an aircraft the F-18 really is. Those two MiG-21s also ended up being the only casualties of the F-18 in history so far. And the Hornet's survivability was demonstrated when a jet took hits on both engines and proceeded to fly 200 kilometers back to base where it was repaired and back to flying again in just a couple of days. So given their track record of reliability, power, and just being an overall badass, it's not hard to understand why the F-18s have been used by the US Navy's air demonstration team, the Blue Angels, since 1988. 
Now, over the years, due to the success of the original F-A-18, many new variants have been built. So the original A variant was a single seater and a B variant was built with two seats by reconfiguring the onboard avionics and also reducing internal fuel storage by 6%. Now, this dual seater B variant was used mainly for training. And just a few years later, the F-A-18A and B developed into the C and D variants respectively. Now, with this upgrade, the D variant with two seats could serve not only as a training aircraft, but also a strike aircraft where the rear seat was occupied by a weapons and sensor systems officer. Now, this was to reduce the load of the pilot as well. While the physical design of the C and D variants largely remained the same as the original, the newer models had many small improvements, including improved night vision with upgraded avionics and sensors, and were able to carry more advanced weapons. Now, over the years, all of these variants have received minor redesigns and engine upgrades, but it seems like really the F-18 can't get much more badass than this. Actually... Oh, hey Gus. Hi Jenny, just to let you know, at the time of filming this video, in 2020, Boeing is rolling out the first updated F-18 Super Hornet Rhino. So, what do we know about them? Uh, well, so in the context of a service life extension program, this renovation is going to improve the service life of the aircraft up to 9,000 hours. But uh, what matters the most, these aircraft will also be upgraded to the Block 3 variant, with an outstanding array of improvements that are going to keep the plane at the leading edge of technology and effectiveness. So what exactly is going to change about this new variant? Well, four main things, structure, aerodynamics, infrared search and track, and network-centric capabilities. But the first element to consider is the service life improvement program. So every structure, metal or composite suffers from fatigue, which are micro cracks with, within the structure, from high loads or forces that happen. And over time, uh, they can weaken the integrity of the structure. And for a naval plane like the F-18, another important component is also corrosion. Hence, the airframe has been designed with life extension in mind also. The Rhinos have less structural parts than their predecessors, making the plane less complex and upgrade and, in general, more robust. The second update to the Rhino is the aerodynamics. Uh, the new Block 3 planes will be equipped with conformal fuel tanks above the inner section of the wing. The purpose of the two conformal tanks is to replace the wing-mounted 480 gallons tanks, uh, freeing up to hard points and reducing the drag if compared with the classic configuration. Third is the IRST, or the Infrared Search and Track Sensor System. This is a technology that, like radar, helps detect and locate aircraft nearby but with the added advantage of stealth, since unlike radar, the infrared search and tracks don't give out any radiation on their own. Today, infrared search and tracks are an essential component on many combat planes, but what is special about the infrared search and track on the Rhino is the ability for plane-to-plane -plane communication, thus providing to the carrying plane a picture derived from more than one infrared search and track if it is available, obviously. Why is this important? Because the infrared search and track cannot natively provide the distance from a target, but using two IRS, looking at the same target and knowing the other IRS position, it is possible to triangulate the target position. To be fair, this is not the only way to extract the distance information from uh, an infrared search and track, but it is surely an effective way. And lastly, the Block 3 has an improved network-centric capability. It has an ACS to allow the pilot to easily process the information from the DTPN, which is an OMS compliant and uses the new TTNT. So it's pretty straightforward, right? Uh Okay, don't worry, I explain this in full detail and more uh, in my videos, so check that out if you're curious. And I suppose this is it for me for now. Bye!
That sounds awesome. Thanks, Gus. And if you're interested, Gus talks even more in depth about the new and improved Super Hornets and Block 3s on his channel. So make sure to go on over and check that out. I'll leave a link here and also in the description below. So there you have it, a brief history of the F-18 Hornets. What do you guys think about the jet? I know it's one name that I've always kind of heard in passing because it's one of the only fighters operated by the Canadian Air Force, but I've never really had a chance to dive deep into the plane and never really realized what a versatile badass it really is. Also, does that make Canada just a giant aircraft carrier? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Is Canada a giant aircraft carrier? Now, as some of you may have noticed, I took a little bit of a break from uploading this past month from YouTube just because I wanted to take some time to think about the future of my channel and what I want my content to look like going forward. So I'd actually love your suggestions and feedback so far. And I've also realized that my original pace of uploading a video every couple of days is certainly not sustainable for me for the long term. So I'll be dialing that back a little, but hopefully having a more consistent upload schedule as well. So I was thinking something like once a week, maybe every Thursday, you guys can expect to see a new video from me. So I'm really excited. I've got some great content lined up for you guys coming up. So that should be very cool. So yeah, another step in my journey to become a legit YouTuber. And the only thing that is left for me to do is to ask you guys to smash that like button and subscribe and hit that notification bell. But that's it from me. I'll see you guys next time.